This is The Comics Alternative, episode 290, a discussion of the James Bond comics from Dynamite Entertainment. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative. I'm Derek. And I'm Gwen, and we're two people with PhDs talking about comics. That's right. And on this special episode of the Comics Alternative, we're going to focus entirely on the kind of James Bond material that Dynamite has been coming out over the past several years. So there's a re really a lot to uh, talk about. But before we get to that, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by those wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts can be anywhere from 20 to 35% off the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off the cover price. Sometimes 50% off cover. But every now and again, you can find discounts that go higher than that. That's right, Derek. And when we looked through to find out what titles we were talking about today might be on DCBS for a discount, we found that almost all of them are not only available, but they're between 30 and 35 percent off. So if you hear some of the titles that we talk about today and they sound really interesting to you, and I think you will find them interesting, then you need to head over to DCBS. That's right. And in fact, as, as Gwen pointed out, everything we're going to be discussing today, with the exception of body, uh, is on DCB service. So definitely head over there and check them out because you can't beat their prices. That's DCBService.com. Go there for all of your comics and James Bond pre-ordering <laughs> needs. And after you do get your text there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that Gwen and Derek sent you. Well, Gwen, how you doing? Derek, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. It's been a while since you and I have been on a podcast episode together. That's right. And, you know, it's it's fitting that we're talking about this because both of us grew up at a time when James Bond was a really big deal. That's right. Yeah, I remember as a kid watching some James Bond movies that would every now and again happen to come on. So, um, yeah, he was uh, part of our, I guess, cultural uh nurturing right nurturing pan what what do you what do you what do you call the pocket of the kangaroo the of a marsupial is it a pocket i don't know okay but that is so not how i would put it but yes okay, Derek. <laughs> i don't think i was nurtured by james bond i think i was enlightened into the patriarchy by james bond but ah. at any but at any rate yes um certainly also the cold war was such a big part of my childhood i think i'm just a little older than you are and i also grew up in an area that was targeted during the cold war because of the manufacturing um i grew up in flint you know and, and near detroit and that we were always being told to get under our desks because it was possible that the soviet union would blow us up and so james bond um to me as a little kid especially he seemed like a superhero um um, and but as I got older and I saw my male cousins enjoying parts of those movies that then I had to sort of look and contend <laughs> with, maybe I had a slightly different attitude, but but still very much a part of my childhood. And not only that, but you'll probably remember, too, that a lot of popular music was generated out of the James Bond franchise, oh, the movie yeah. franchise, um, including some of my very favorite songs like Live and Let Die. Oh, and Live and Let Die. Absolutely. You know, one of my very favorite songs. And so, um, so yeah, I think for both of us um, growing up, this was at least, um, you know, part of, as you say, the, the, the marsupial pocket of our childhood. Well, 
Gwen, let's go ahead and jump into the discussion of these James Bond books. And uh, what we're going to do is not discuss each one, let's say, in chronological order as they were published, but just talk about all of them as a whole. So Mm -hmm. all of the books, and right now I guess we're going to be discussing nine texts. Uh, All but one of them so far have been collected in trade. So those are in order. Varger by Warren Ellis and Jason Masters, and the trade was published in 2016. Adelon, Warren Ellis, Jason Masters, trade was published in 2017. Hammerhead, Andy Diggle, and Luca Casalanguida, 2017. Black Box, Benjamin Percy and Ralph Rabosco, 2017. Felix Slater, James Robinson, and Aaron Campbell, another 2017 text. Kill Chain, Andy Diggle, and Luca Casalanguida, 2018. Casino Royale, Van Jensen, and Dennis Calero, 2018. Quite recently, Case Files, by a variety of different writers and artists, which came out in 2018, again, very recently. And then the six-issue series that has not yet been collected, Body, and this is written by Alice Cott with a variety of different artists. It's so, a lot. That That's a lot. And again, it, because it's a lot, there's no way that we're going to discuss each one of these texts in any kind of detail. But maybe we should begin, Gwen, by talking a little bit, and, and I think you already touched upon this, but... Not only your familiarity with James Bond, but your appreciation of James Bond as an adult. Well, for one thing, James Bond, excuse me, Ian Fleming, I should say, was really good friends with a major children's literature author who also wrote spy fiction to a certain extent and horror stories. And um, Roald Dahl was a really good friend of Ian Fleming's. And in fact, they they sort of grew up um, in each other's shadows in a way and, and also helped each other out in terms of their careers. And so it was actually really through, as a, even as a kid reading about Roald Dahl, that I also um, read about Ian Fleming. And I, I will say that, that I like mystery novels. Um, you know, that that's one of my favorite genres of reading. Um, and this is enough of a close, it's close enough akin. Um, I, I really enjoy stories, especially that are set in the past. And, but I will say that what makes these stories so interesting is most of them are, in fact, all of them are contemporary and are dealing with ethical issues that we currently are debating in our society. In fact, there's a lot of reference to things like Blackwater um, or to, um, I would say, you're talking about in these James Bond books. Yeah. And these, these like contemporary texts and, and so bringing them into the 21st century, I think that in a way it's been done sort of the way that Fleming was commenting on the Cold War and on British society in in his novels. I really think that these um, collaborators who are currently doing these comics are commenting on our geopolitical situation. And so there's a real bridge there for me. And that's why I, I really enjoyed reading these. Actually, it, it, it was enough like the books that that I'd read when I was younger that, you know, I could see the see what was going on there. But on the other hand, it was dealing with really contemporary things. And Mm -hmm. I liked that. You know, I have to admit, I have never read an Ian Fleming book, a James Bond text. Um, I've seen many of the movies. Uh, I, I, again, I'll admit that I haven't seen more recent films, but the classic ones I've seen now, I may not have seen them for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, (laughs) let's say a dyed in the wool James Bond fan. Although, (laughs) Once, uh, several years ago, once I read that first issue of Warren Ellis and Jason Masters' Varger, I was won over. I said, okay, I have definitely got to keep up with this James Bond material. And this idea for an episode specifically devoted to Dynamite's James Bond is something that we've been thinking about for a while. So I'm glad we're finally finally doing this because now it gives us an opportunity to talk about all this stuff. And I, I really love the material. And I'll tell you, the thing that I appreciate most or one of the things I appreciate most about all but one of these texts is that they're original stories. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, the exception, of course, is Casino Royale. And we can talk about this in a moment, but Casino Royale is, is kind of an outlier here. Um, but nonetheless, it's a James Bond graphic novel. Dynamite published it, and so we wanted to include it. But with that exception, all the other stories are original, and they're set in a more contemporary setting. And as you point out, they're dealing with contemporary issues. Mm-hmm. Um Many of these books, not all of them, but many of them have essays in the back, uh, which are essays, actually kind of articles or interviews where I think various, I can't remember which ones, but various newspapers had interviewed these writers like Diggle, I know, and I think maybe Mm -hmm. Percy, uh, asking them about their relationship with James Bond, why they're doing this. Um, mm-hmm. what kind of themes that they're, that they're dealing with. And it's interesting that in some texts like Black Box and Kill Chain, it seems as if Percy or Diggle are commenting on extremely contemporary issues, although they point out that these issues aren't necessarily what they had in mind, but they said you can apply it to, to what's going on right now. So, for instance, mm-hmm. you know, with, with Black Box, uh, you know, written by Benjamin Percy, illustrated by Ralph uh, Lobosco, um, it deals with issues of social media and the proliferation of online information in ways that can be compromising. <laughs> A very contemporary right. issue for us, especially given uh-huh. Facebook. Yeah, and and given what's, I mean, the, the one of the characters I think right in the comic says this makes anything that's been dredged up on Wiki um, WikiLeaks look look you know Junior League or whatever. So mm-hmm. there's ways that <laughs> there's ways in which um, you know current stories ripped from the headlines, if you will, um, <laughs> in in Varger, you know, the idea about. Um, sort of not only trying to cover up um, genocide is <laughs> certainly discussed, but also the idea of whether or not people should um, be able to consent to having medical experimentation done on them. You know, I mean, these are really serious issues. The idea of um, using uh, sort of a brilliant man using his incredible intellect um, to to basically, uh, you know, do really terrible things to other human beings and to justify it um, in a really disassociative way that's frightening. I mean, there are ways in which you can see that happening today with very, very wealthy people who have almost every sort of experimentation ability at their fingertips. And you kind of wonder, like, what are they doing? Um, what is their what is their goal? There's a really ethical set of discussions in these texts about um, about modern technology. And I thought that was fascinating. In fact, for me, it was the most interesting part of these texts. And um, I, I actually really liked Varger a great deal because I think it it had a very narrow um, purview and it just achieved it. And it's really discussing, you know, what what is it ethical to, to do in terms of medical experimentation. And I thought it was really well done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it was. And in fact, Let's go ahead and say at the outset, and I don't know if you're, you'll agree with me on this, but um, of all of these texts, it seems to me that the work of Ellis and Masters functions as a touchstone. In other words, mm-hmm. uh, Diggle, Percy, Robinson, so on and so forth, Cod, I'm sure, um, probably look to the work of Ellis and then you know his illustrator, Jason Masters, mm-hmm. as something to emulate. In other words... It's almost as if Ellis and Masters threw down the gauntlet and said, okay, anyone else? Can you do better? Uh, measure up to this. Because Varger and Edelon are absolutely incredible. Now, Varger and Edelon are two different texts, but they nonetheless function as the first volume of James Bond from Dynamite. Mm-hmm. Um, so Hammerhead would be volume two. Black Box would be volume three. Uh, and even though Varger and Edelon are quite different in terms of what they focus on, their subject matter themes and whatnot, uh, they're similar in terms of, obviously, the writing style and also master's art. Uh, and I mm-hmm. think we, you and I were talking a little bit before we turned on the mic about the just the incredible – uh, dynamism, uh, the, uh, the, the kineticness that comes through from master's art. Yeah, I would really say to our listeners, 
open up and read the first 12 pages of Varger. And I think you will be blown away with the technical skill, um, not just the scripting, because actually most of it is silent. Um, but it's a it's an action sequence with uh, as most Bond films as well start out this way. So in a way and books, um, but it's an action sequence. And um, Derek, I was I was sort of thinking about the way not only panel placement works here, but color. Um, there's a scene where where clearly Ellis and Masters want us to focus on a gun. And the way that it's drawn in a small panel at the bottom of the page, but with a completely red background, it's just so powerful and evocative that even though it's the smallest panel on the in the layout, your eye is drawn to it immediately. And it it's just evocative of the violence that's going on and the bloodiness. And it's an amazing fight scene. And I, as you well know, this is not normally something that I enjoy. Um, but I was completely drawn in and just amazed by the technical virtuosity. Really, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, another thing that is notable about the work of Jason Masters, I, I would argue that among all the artists that we're going to be discussing who, who've mm -hmm. done the, the dynamite James Bond stuff, um, his work is, how do I put this, probably the cleanest. And I don't mean that in any kind of judgment manner. In other words, that's not to take away from what uh, Labosco Le Le does or Aaron Campbell does or Luca Casanguida does. Um, it's They have a different type of style, and that's fine because sometimes – the style of the artist suits the particular writer. So when James Bond, is, or I'm James Bond, when James Robinson <laughs> is writing uh, Felix Later, um, an artist like Aaron Campbell works really well with him. Um, but I think Jason Masters, his illustration work really stands out in that it's clean it is easily discernible. We don't. It doesn't have the noir feel that some of the other artists work does do you agree mm -hmm. oh absolutely and i i also think that just the the line is is consistent mm -hmm. in um, master's work whereas i would argue in some of the other texts that we look at there's there's a real consistency perhaps in the depiction of bond and his features but then the other characters it feels like they were just thrown sketched in sometimes or it's just there's a real attention to detail in those first two volumes that is consistent throughout and in a way it i, I not only admired it but i didn't really realize that consistency until i started looking at subsequent volumes and wasn't necessarily seeing it there mm -hmm. so i do kind of want to tip the hat to to masters and ellis because the especially the the layout of the, the the first two volumes was really amazing and done so well and a lot of it is wordless which actually i appreciate i think sometimes there if there's too much um wordiness if there's too many text boxes if there's too much dialogue in a scene where we're looking at sort of people fighting or whatever it really takes away from that and i appreciate how it's not that they're entirely silent but when words are used in those sequences they're used to affect usually irony frankly and i love that so i i really enjoyed it mm. i did okay by point of contrast you were talking about the the limitation of language or text in the work mm -hmm. of Ellison Masters, and I agree. The complete opposite of that <laughs> is what we find in the, I guess, the one anomaly of this list of nine yeah. texts, and that is Van Jensen and Dennis Calero's Casino Royale. Um, and I think the reason why it is so damn text heavy is because it is an outlier. It is different. It stands out. Uh, Casino Royale is the only one of these nine texts that we're discussing today that is an adaptation of an original book of, of mm -hmm. Ian Fleming's, you know, in fact, his very first. And um, the we're including it because, you know, it was published by Dynamite. It deals with James Bond. But it really does stand apart from all of the other works that we're discussing this uh, this week. Um but it's very text heavy because it's attempting to adapt faithfully. And it even says this in the introduction. And I think the introduction is written by the, the Ian Fleming 
production core or something. I can't remember what it's called. Um, it's yeah, yeah. Hold on, I, I, I have it right here. Uh, but they even say in this intro, introduction, oh, Ian Fleming Productions Limited. Right. Uh, but they they say that uh, this is a faithful adaptation, and so in being faithful. I think they need to include the text in almost a novelistic way. In fact, that's how this book reads. It's, I, I, I think the images are important, but not near as important as the text in this book, just because it's attempts to be so faithful to the original. Um, and for that reason, I found it a little more difficult, or at least it took a lot longer to get through Casino Royale than many of these other ones. Yeah, I agree. And actually, for me, I started to think about a lot about placement, text placement, because in some instances, um, there was so much text. And you could tell that they were trying to vary where it went in the panels. <laughs> and I started, you know, when you start thinking about things like that, instead of just enjoying the work and then coming back and thinking about things like that later, um, I think that that perhaps... Yeah, I, I preferred the the non adaptations. I find, you know, there are some wonderful adaptations out there. In fact, we've we've talked before about um, really interesting adaptations of Edgar Allan Poe's work, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and again, there's a there's a um, set of texts that are very language dependent. I mean, Poe had a particular way of writing that obviously adapters want to include. But in this particular instance, sometimes there was just so much text that it was difficult to en to enjoy the, the 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 or I should say the flow of the comic was interrupted a bit. So I mean it was an interesting enough read and and um certainly diverting but I felt I didn't I didn't enjoy it in the same way that I did the the original stories that right. we read. Right. I agree. Now, okay, you've expressed your love of Varger and the work of Allison Masters. Which other James Bond work that we're discussing really stood out to you? Okay, so, and this is where I think we're going to have a lot of fun discussion, because for me, it was Alex Cott's body. And I liked it for a number of reasons that I think I and I'm excited to, for, for people to hear what you thought as well, because we had a really good conversation before we started off. But before we turned on the mic. Yeah, yeah, before we turned on the mic, we were talking about it. But here's why I like it. I like it because first of all, it's a series of, as you pointed out, in our conversation, a series of short um, seemingly unconnected, although ultimately connected stories, each of which um, provides us with an understanding of both a particular outward scar that James Bond bears from his work and a contemplation on the inner scars that he bears. And in fact, the first volume, um, which is called The Body, um, is begins with Bond recounting... First chapter. Um, yeah. Sorry, yeah. first okay. chapter begins with Bond recounting a fight that he's had and a, an altercation and with his doctor, who is asking him routine health questions as they're having this conversation. And then the story is told in a flashback. And at the end, um, uh, you know, the as on the one hand, Bond is being shown in the comic in the past reading a note from an assassin um, who explains why he was compelled to attempt murder against his will. And the actual text in the comic is Bond's doctor advising him that he needs to go through a mental health examination. And I really thought the juxtaposition of those images and the text was pretty masterful. And what I appreciated about this particular series was that there was a lot less gratuitous sex and violence and a lot more discussion of the inner world of James Bond. And for me as a reader, I just really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed it enough to, to look up an interview um, that Cott did as he was doing this. And, and I want to quote something that he says, you know, he says, um, I feel like um, 
He says, I'll, he, he says, James Bond in many ways is, quote, an imperialist colonialist construct. And he says, quote, I'll also add patriarchal and racist since Bond's always a white man who objectifies women and uses them without regard for their well-being. Although I think that's debatable in these series. But anyway, he's also very cool in many ways. Like, wow, super driven, excellent problem solving skills in some ways. A chameleon doesn't give up. And it was interesting because that understanding of James Bond sort of equates to my understanding. And maybe that's why so much of what goes on in this comic is a little bit more cerebral. It's less action adventure And as you, you pointed out to me earlier, I think you felt it was maybe a little bit, it was drawn in such a way that Bond looks a little bit more superhero-esque mm. than in the previous volumes. And uh, so I'd love to hear, I think our, our listeners would love to hear what, what you thought, but that was really my favorite out of all that we read. And um, But maybe again, because it appeals to sort of not only my worldview, but also to my preference for what I would read on my own. So. You know, I guess my, I don't, okay, first and foremost, I don't dislike body. And in fact, if I would read it as a trade, in, every, in, a, in other words, instead of six individual issues, reading it in one text, I may feel differently. And, and I probably will when the, the trade comes out. Um, my problem, or quote unquote problem, my issues or the reasons why I'm not as enthusiastic as you are, maybe that's a better way of putting it, about <laughs> body is basically twofold. I think one reason may be a little more insignificant than the other. Um, the more insignificant reason, I guess, is I tend as a reader to privilege longer, more cohesive texts. In other words, novel, something more novelistic. Mm -hmm. So instead of a collection of stories, and, and I'm fine. I mean, there are many collection of stories that I've read that I absolutely love. Um, but even when it comes to stories, I much more prefer something like a short story cycle than just a collection of disparate stories that are not connected in any way. But still, there's that connectedness, right? There's that coherency through whatever it is that's cycling all of these various stories. But you know, I prefer something like, let's say, the Black Black Box or Kill Chain or Felix Later over Body because they're long, cohesive stories with one artist. And with Body, we have, you know, Alice Scott writes all six issues, but in each issue, you have a different artist. And I have mm -hmm. no problem with that. It's just that my preference as a reader is – a little different from that, right? I mean, I, I prefer something like a Diggle and Kessing Linguida uh, or an Ellis and Masters, you know, them doing a longer work, just mm -hmm. the two of them. Okay, so that's the kind of more insignificant reason. But the more significant reason I think that I have an issue with body is that I think throughout, maybe with the exception of one, maybe two issues in, in this six issue series. Um, James Bond comes across more as a superhero than as a problematic or fallible man who happens to be a super spy. Uh, in fact, I even hesitate to call him a super spy, even though many people would. Um, but when I say that he comes across as a superhero, both visually and also, I think, in terms of the way that he is written, uh, he comes across as a superhero. And there are... Uh, I know in that very first issue, I can't remember who the artist is, but he he illustrates Bond with this really big, muscular, chiseled body. It's as if we're looking at the body of Clark Kent slash Superman, and that's not James Bond. And that happens two or three other times in this series. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I saw it. It's Antonio Fuso, I think, who you're okay. thinking about in the first one. And it's it is true that there's this especially this one image where you're seeing Bond face first, sort of looking at you directly. Um, and he's all beaten up. He's got like this huge black eye and his I mean, he just looks awful. But his his shoulders are humongous. They're like linebacker humongous. And his head is Superman drawn. You know, I mean, all the the exact same chin angles the chiseled nose and he's he just looks like a really messed up superman and i get that but in another way he looks really middle-aged and 
I don't know. I just had that sort of dark night, sort of Frank Miller um, cast back for but, me. But that's a superhero. Uh, I know, but I'm okay with that. Like, mm-hmm. it didn't bother me that much because in some ways, um, the the character of James Bond has always sort of felt like that to me. I don't know. I just, I understand exactly what you're saying and I don't necess- I don't disagree. Um, but for me, it wasn't as disjunctive, I guess, maybe okay. because of my own, like the way I tend to categorize things. I, I definitely, um, like in kill chain, for instance, there are some other images where, where again, um, I feel like Bond looks more like a superhero than mm-hmm. like that's why I'm I'm gonna go back to saying if if I was looking for if I were looking for a text that reminded me a lot of the films from my childhood, especially Sean Connery and, and Roger Moore's James Bond, and was interested in sort of the flavor of the Brit the sort of Britain that Ian Fleming wants to bring forward, Varger certainly did that for me. Mm. I felt I felt that link in a very definite way, even more so than Casino Royale, honestly. So you um, thought that Varger of all nine texts was the most, quote unquote, cinematic? Yeah, I felt I, I also feel like, you know, this was the, the first text. It was the one that the, the members of the Ian Fleming production company chose Ellis particularly to do this. I think he approached it with a great deal of seriousness. In one interview, he said that he'd read every single novel um, and before he even plotted out his own text. And I there's there's also a sense that Masters, I think, was was going for a somewhat modern version of the the sort of slick James Bond, the where James is more, you know, yes, he's athletic, but he's not chunky, like, you know, superhero esque. And so there was a sort of symmetry there between the writing and the the images that really felt like it was part of a continuation of a dynasty, if you will. Mm-hmm. Whereas some of the later texts don't some in some instances it perhaps it's because there wasn't as much time or attention to detail. In other instances because maybe like maybe Alex Cott had a different, slightly different agenda and a different relationship relationship to the texts. Um, so I don't know. It's, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, we know Warren Ellis is British. He probably grew up with these texts or at least the films and there may be a connection there too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that you saw Varger as cinematic and maybe the most of the bunch for me, that was hammerhead. Um, okay. Yeah. I yeah, can see that. Uh, by Andy Diggle and Luca Kessing Laguida. Um, this one actually is the third book, or I guess you could say the second volume, of uh, the Dynamite James Bond. Um, and the reason I see it as more cin- the most cinematic is that it does the most world hopping. Mm. And there are, I think we have the most, I guess, grandiose events that take place. Uh, and so this is something that would be a big budget film. Right. Yeah, I can see that, too. Yeah. yeah. And, I, I, and I enjoyed it. Barger, I enjoyed too. it. Yeah. Like in Barger, you start off in Helsinki and then you're in a bed set in Brixton and then you're inside, you know, uh, the, the headquarters and then you're off to Berlin. So I kind of saw that there, too. But yeah, Hammerhead also, frankly, the variant covers look like film posters for mm-hmm. Hammerhead, in yeah. my opinion. You know, I mean, very much reminiscent of James Bond, you know, like the the um, the the sort of the the one cover where he's falling through the British flag and it's breaking up like it's a stained glass that he's being so these th- that he's falling through and he's in silhouette. I mean that looks just like a 1970s you know or early 80s James Bond movie poster too. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I yeah, really I definitely enjoyed that. Felt, yeah, I yeah. enjoyed it too. In fact, it was probably my next favorite after hmm. Varger and Body. I think I liked Hammerhead probably the best. Yeah, I really enjoyed Hammerhead, but um, and I'm a big fan of uh, Andy Diggle and not just his James Bond work, of course, but his, his other stuff. And he does he does great intrigue and definitely great noir writing. Um, I enjoyed and appreciated Kill Chain. Again, by mm. Diggle and Casa Laguida more right. than uh, Hammerhead. And I think I like Kill Chain more than Hammerhead because it's a little more tempered. In other words, we don't have as much world hopping. I mean, 
we do go to different locations, um, but we don't have these grandiose events that take place. You know, in other mm-hmm. words, in you know, entire structures falling into the sea or an atomic weapon almost wiping out London. Uh, we don't have that. I mean, we have other kind of intrigue and dangers in Kill Chain, uh, and I think the Kill Chain is a little more intricate. Uh, and when I read Kill Chain, I got the sense that Diggle, who did a great job on Hammerhead, um, learned certain things, and then he applied what he learned mm-hmm. doing Hammerhead to Kill Chain. And because it is a little more, again, intricate in terms of the various events that take place, um, I, I appreciated that more. Yeah, and it... it- I will say that the, a lot of the the premise there about you know um, former allies having falling out is mm-hmm. pretty much what's going on between <laughs> and, the United States and, and most of Europe. And, and that's I thought another that a, reason why I love yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, and so that correspondence to me was was pretty interesting, and I enjoyed that mm-hmm. a lot. Yeah, um, and that's what I mean with these. I think if if you've just been following current events. If you are, if you actually are paying attention to what's going on in the world, these so are the authors of these texts, and it's there's a lot of correspondences that I found that were that maybe just sort of stop and really think for a while about contemporary events, and I think that's what you want a really good spy thriller to do. You want it to feel as if it could really happen, as if these things could unfold. And while I'll admit that some of the plots are a little out there, you know, um, nonetheless, for instance, the opioid crisis that's going on in this country and I think is woefully underreported and is not being dealt with well really is part of what's going on in Varger and it's handled pretty well. It, it, there's a real link there between unemployment and despair and drug use um, that I thought was very poignant. So in many of these texts, there's a, I think a really good link to what's going on in, in the larger political world. I really enjoyed that part of it. Yeah. And, you know, as we already mentioned, uh, Black Box, and that's another text mm-hmm. that I really enjoyed uh, just because it deals with I mean, I think it's a well-written story, but also thematically it deals with issues that are very contemporary to us, right? You know, the mm-hmm. you know the use of information online, social media, mm-hmm. and, and whatnot, and the potential dangers of that. Uh, so I, I appreciate what Percy did in, in, in Black Box. Um, you know, for me, the outlier of this bunch, outside of Casino Royale, uh, is Felix Later mm. by James Robinson and Aaron Campbell. And the reason why it's an outlier is because even though it's a dynamite James Bond book, it doesn't really deal with James Bond. It deals with, you know, his CIA colleague, Felix Later, and not the Felix Later that we see throughout most of these texts, who actually is a part of and, you know, participates within the CIA. This is a post CIA later. And this mm-hmm. is a later who has fallen. Uh, he's broken. He is trying to put his life back together. He can't seem to do so. And I think think because of that, because we do have a figure who maybe, you know, once had things, you know, all figured out, but now seems to have come unraveled. Um, I enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and I enjoyed his his rough, sort of rough Robert Redford good looks, too. So there's that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and so I, I, it was great. Now, every now and again, I think there are three, four times that we see James Bond. Uh, you know, he he <laughs> does walk on, so to speak. Uh, right. And I think more time. I think in every case, there are flashbacks or something that you know lead, later is thinking about. Um, but I thought that that was a really well told story as well. And it's interesting that they're doing so many spinoffs. I um, I I find that compelling too i think there's there's been a move towards um especially characters like money petty and m even in the movies themselves the more contemporary movies um and in the series um to sort of focus on those characters more and to get a little bit more of their backstory and i really sort of enjoy that i think it makes for a nice compliment okay i agree with you and i don't it it, i guess for me it all depends now felix later Yes, it definitely did work. And 
but again, that is, you know, as as I admitted earlier, I tend to privilege kind of longer, more cohesive narratives. And that's right. what we have with Felix later. Now, the one shots I think that you were referring mm-hmm. to, Money right. Penny and M, these are right. collected in the most recent publication. Right, case, the case fi- files. Right, case yeah. files. Um and this includes service, money penny. Solstice and M, and these are the these are one shots. And let me see, uh, Kieran Gillen is the writer of Service. Jody Hauser is the writer of Money Penny. Ibrahim uh, Mustafa is the writer and artist of Solstice, and then Declan Shavy is the writer of M. And I think right. of those four stories. Okay, first and foremost, let me just say of all of these texts. Case Files, to me, is the least successful of the nine that we're discussing. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I'll tell you why in a moment. But, um, you know, they include these one-shots. And of these four one-shots, I think Solstice and M strike me as um, the most successful. And I think Mm -hmm. because the most cohesive. Uh, I thought Service was a little scattered and with money penny i'll be honest i really didn't know what the hell was going on <laughs> i mean i kind of understood the action but what kind of motivation who are these people that she's after and why are they after you know because you know money penny m i think m and several i guess junior colleagues go to is it boston to, yeah, I think to, so. To yeah. a college or university for some kind of lecture. And then while they're there, they're attacked. Now, who are these people who are attacking them and the professor who's sponsoring them? And right. and why? And we're never told that. So right. there's some interesting action sequences, but we really don't know much outside of the action. And so I think that uh, Jody Hauser did a good job in – representing money penny as a more complex character than we get in most of these other texts right uh, it's just give her you know give us some meaningful action <laughs> along with this character uh something that actually makes sense because i i i couldn't make hide her hair of uh what was going on in that story yeah and, it was a lot of people yelling at each other which yeah. you know <laughs> An- another reason why i think that case files is the least successful of these nine texts um you're dealing with e- even I, even i think the best story of the four solstice it's not the most complete when you're dealing with one shots you really don't have much space to really deal with, confront, contextualize, and potentially tie up a lot of the things that go on, especially in this particular genre, you know, which deals with intrigue. Because when you're dealing mm-hmm. with intrigue and mystery, I mean, there are a lot of moving parts. And you really can't do that in a 20 or 22 page comic book. And so um, I, I think that as one shot comic books, Service, Money, Penny, Solstice, and M were fine. But collecting them in a trade case files, did we need that? I don't know. Well, and also, I think if you were just browsing through, it might be the first book that you would buy or the first trade that you would buy if you weren't keeping up with the news and you just saw it. And honestly, if that were the case, I don't think you'd be getting a full understanding of what Dynamite has been trying to do. No, 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 you definitely wouldn't. And I think you would uh, be misserved. Mm-hmm. Which so, is unfortunate. yeah, I, I don't I don't disagree with you at all. I think that that truly I would view these as a companion to the other books that we've been talking about. But again, because they were collected the way they were, someone who was unfamiliar with this might just click on it and buy it and then be somewhat disappointed. Yeah. You know, whereas I would argue that 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 Alex Cott's body that even though there's their segments, they're seemingly unrelated in some ways. I, I would say that there's enough cohesion there in terms of, of sort of the way that Cott labels each issue 
uh, you know, with a different body part, right? Heart, mind, etc. Mm-hmm. But also it sticks enough to, to what we're used to with James Bond that it doesn't seem like an outlier. It doesn't seem strange. It may not be the structure that everybody would like, but the story is in, in the way that it's dealt with, isn't that different. Whereas with this, it's, it feels more like a hodgepodge. Um, and so I was, I agree. I, I think that again, if this were the first thing I were reading, I wouldn't have been that interested to read beyond it. Yeah. A case file, is definitely a hodgepodge. But, you know, getting back to body, remember a moment ago that I said that I may feel differently if I read body as a trade mm-hmm. instead of as uh, six individual issues. There is a story there. And even though it does seem to be disjointed, in other words, it seems mm-hmm. to be like six different narratives, um, especially by the time we get to that six, the last issue. Uh, right. One of the things that Cott does is he, I, mean, I think he even anticipates this in the fifth issue and even even maybe earlier, um, but definitely in the sixth issue, he kind of ties things up in a way in that he demonstrates that what we've been reading across these six issues is actually one longer story and not just six mm-hmm. individual stories. And so when I got to that sixth issue, I think I appreciated body more than I did as I was reading each individual issues up until or before issue number six. I mean, I still have an issue with the whole superhero James Bond <laughs> representation, but uh, but there is a story there. I think there is a longer, somewhat maybe semi-cohesive story going on there. And maybe if I read it, again, if I read it as a trade, I'd uh, like it better. Well, you know, all of these texts contain, not all of them, but some of them, I think the strongest ones, contain moments where James Bond is considering the the disassociative um, aspects of being uh, uh, what is often a killer for hire. You know, I mean, there's there. Yes, there are supposedly noble reasons or noble things that Bond is is standing up for. But there are ways in which he very often feels, I think, um, disassociated from himself, from other people. At one point, there's the way it's handled in. Um, I think it's the beginning of is it the beginning of Black Box where he's um, about to drop down out of that gondola and it's going to be super cold and he he equates the coldness out there with numbness and that oh, that's yeah, what you need yeah. that's in a great order opening. to succeed yeah in order to succeed in this job you either are you either go numb or you go go mad well at the end of body when he's sitting there with felix Leiter and he's talking about um sort of the the things that he's been going through and he says quote someone told me we change throughout time whether we realize it or not it occurs to me i had considered human beings fairly static until that point and i think that that Again and again in this series, there's a there's a really nice way in which all of these authors, um, you know, are are dealing with that issue of what it means to actually be a spy, what it does to you on the inside. And maybe that's why I mean, that was a very pat ending. I know it's like tying up things with a bow. (laughs) I'm aware. But every once in a while, a pat ending is is satisfying. And uh, that I thought that was pretty cool. But yeah, I love the opening to Black Box. I thought it was visually stunning. But also, I thought the dialogue was was really cool, Mm -hmm. too. So I want to go back to something that you said earlier when you were talking about an interview you read with Alice Cott and Mm -hmm. the way that he was describing James Bond. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, how was it? Uh, He was describing him as, I guess, a womanizer or a a misogynist. And then you you said just briefly and then let it go without following up that you don't (laughs) think you'd agree with him on these these James Bond comics from Dynamite. Yeah, and I think that's because the comics creators are aware that they're writing in the 21st century. You know, this is a character who was born out of a very different time. And uh, not only a time when when men and women uh, were expected to f- fulfill certain roles, but in which women were really complicit and sometimes unconsciously complicit in perpetuating those roles. And in the 21st century, in the shadow of Me Too, I can't imagine any thinking person creating a comic that absolutely paralleled not only what was in the novels, but probably more importantly, what was in the films. I mean, Octopussy is a perfect example of this, right? <laughs> well, I mean, look at, you know, the name, the name Octopussy. Yeah, I mean, okay. it's just, just, you know, it, 
period. That's all I don't, you don't have to say anything else really about that. Whereas I really feel that these authors were trying not, not to turn James Bond into this, you know, monogamous sort of former choir boy type figure. A politically but, correct James Bond. Uh, yeah, or whatever. But, but. Actually, what they were trying to do was to show someone who, and I guess maybe this is why I like body as well, because it comes up in this um, a couple of times, but someone who regrets perhaps not having a, a consistent um, a partner in his life and not necessarily having stability in his life. And I mean, the fact that he's even thinking those things, I mean, the stopping in the middle of a mission to ruminate on them is, is a change. And um, the way that women are depicted in the text is is varied. Um, I'm thinking of in Varger, there's all sorts of interesting women who show up in this this comic and have interesting roles in it. And so I I really feel that it's a much more nuanced portrayal of men, of women and of of social issues in general in these texts. But I do think Alex Cott is right to to we can't ignore the the genesis of them either. Um, Ian Fleming was writing at a time when white male patriarchy was simply unquestioned and or was being questioned but that questioning was being like quashed whereas now i think young young comics creators who are um sort of and even middle-aged comics creators in the case of ellis are are really much more uh, i think sensitive to these issues and probably they themselves have thought through a lot of these issues so i i just felt it was it, i think that that there's there's no reason not to pick these up and see what you think, I guess is what I'm saying. If you're listening, if you're actually have gotten all this way into this podcast <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I think that they're, that you should pick them up and you should look at them because I think that that uh, that the sexual dynamics are, are much more, I think, contemporary um, and take take into account a variety of viewpoints. So right. I thought that was Again, with one you know, exception, cool. and this is you know coming back to Casino Royale. I mean, this yeah. is this is well, the standout different. here, yeah. Um, because we because this is an adaptation, and it's purportedly a faithful adaptation. We do mm-hmm. have an older male patriarchal James Bond. Um, although the the thing that now I you know I I did not read. Have you read uh, the original novel Casino Royale? No, I haven't. I've seen the film, obviously, but I haven't I haven't read the original yeah. book. Which which film? Um, Casino Royale. But but which it's version? A film. Right, but which oh, one? um, the one with Sean Connery. Okay, right? Because the no, there was a more contemporary Casino Royale. Oh, there was, yeah, but the yeah, original film Casino Royale was a comedy that was it was a kind of a disaster. Uh, oh God! But okay, I, well I just remember seeing. I've it seen it multiple times because Woody it. Allen's okay. in it. Oh, for God's sake! And he okay, well. he plays he <laughs> plays <laughs> Little Jimmy Bond. Oh my God! Okay, yeah, okay. I obviously am thinking of some other James Bond film that I saw then yeah. because. And Peter Sellers plays James Bond in Casino in the original Casino Royale. Oh, I know this movie you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. And in fact, right. I have to say, as I was reading, as I was going through Casino Royale, I kept thinking of that Burt Bacharach song. I couldn't get it out of my head. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just kind of cracking up yeah. now because I'm trying to. I'm now really trying to remember because I'm so certain that I saw this this movie, but now I'm not remembering it. Actually, I correct it. myself. Both Peter Sellers and, but maybe primarily David Niven play James Bond. And I mean, it is a weird film. And oh, it was I remember this movie. Okay, it's a, a variety. Pink Panther film. Yeah. No, 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 no. Not a Pink Panther film. Oh. It's a James Bond sure? film, but it's okay. It was directed by a variety of different people. John Huston being one, I think. Oh my god! Okay, um, and it it's very confusing. Um, it has um, briefly at one point Peter Sellers. There's okay. Ors- Orson Welles <laughs> is in it. Oh my uh, god! Okay, Woody Allen. Um, it's it is just strange, and it's it's fun if you're a uh, James Bond aficionado and take your James Bond seriously, you probably don't like this film. I enjoy it because it's a comedy and it has Woody Allen. So, of course, I'm going to like it. A shot in the dark is what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Which, again, was David Niven and Peter Sellers. Okay, good Lord. My 1960s, obviously, are fuzzy right now. (laughs) No, this is But there's another James Bond movie that I'm thinking of that was a serious film. And it was with Sean Connery. And I've confused it with Casino Royale. So, to answer you now, Derek, no, I've read, I've 
neither read nor seen the antecedent, or at least not okay. remembering it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're on your own, bucko. <laughs> mm. Um, you know, I, w- I want to get your sense of things. Um, do you feel that as Dynamite's James Bond initiative, if we want to call it that, mm-hmm. has evolved, you know, starting with Ellis and Masters, moving on to Diggle and Casa Linguida, so on and so forth, that I don't want to say that it has changed for the worse, but do you feel that it's changed? Yes, because again, for me, one of the things that what I really feel is that I think Ellis spent a lot of time and Masters too, probably, really planning out those first two volumes. You can just feel the well, attention first, for, to yeah, detail. That, well, the first you know, volume, yeah. The first volume, yeah, yeah, sorry. The first two, I guess, stories. Um, and I, I don't feel that that has been carried over, but what I do think is that um, to, to a greater and lesser extent, as you said earlier, some of these subsequent authors have learned a lot from reading those comics and are certainly responding to them. Okay. And I would say that one of the things that is consistent through most of them is an intro that is filled with adventure and you're sort of thrust right into the middle of the action And you have to work really hard to catch up and to figure out what's going on, um, which is true in the films, too, I might add. And so that the cinematic quality that that I was feeling and reading, say, um, you know, Black Box and some of the the, um, Kill Chain, I I think that's where it comes from. So I, I see a consistency there. Um, But I would certainly, if you gave these to me without the author and, um, you know, um, comics creators' names on them, I would see, I would feel definite differences. I would feel that, um, especially, I mean, I think body is way different than, I mean, if you looked at those two, that's a huge evolution. And um, between the first and, and the last, even though I think that Cott really worked very hard on plotting, mm-hmm. but he was trying to do something very different. Well, yeah, and, and, and Cott's a know, great writer, yeah. But I'll be interested to see the next, the next, um, you know, um, story to come out. Origin? Have you read any? Uh, no, I haven't read... read any of the Origin text. And in fact, I don't know if the first issue of Origin is out now. I know that number two is being solicited this month, and we're in the tail end of uh, August. So, um, so yeah, maybe even issue number one is not out. I'd be curious to 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 read origin just to see because okay my feeling of things and this is the reason why i've asked you i think that you know as we've mentioned before ellis and masters basically set a standard i think that since then diggle percy robinson i think that they have it tried their best and i think successfully so to emulate in many ways but yet be unique in their own ways, but to emulate or to keep in mind what Ellis and Master set out when they established uh, the James Bond franchise at Dynamite. Um, mm. I'm not convinced that after Diggle and Casanguina's kill chain, if if the center is going to hold, so to speak, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, um, and. We can see, you know, these various case file one shot service, money, penny, solstice, M, which again, I don't want to call them throwaway, but they're, it, it, it's not, uh, it's not the James Bond that we had been getting. Mm-hmm. And some people don't I like agree. that, and that's fine. And then with Cot, it's very different. And, and again, difference is fine, but it's not the James Bond that we get with, let's say, Ellis, Diggle, Percy, Robinson. Um, and so I'm curious what Bo- uh, uh, James Bond origin is going to be like. And, and again, I wonder if it's going to feel more like adaptation. I um, don't know. Be, I know that Jeff know? Parker's the writer of that, um, mm-hmm. and, and he's very adept, of course. But um, I don't know. I, I mean, to me, to one see. of the one of the strengths is the the fact that it's set in the present day. I really think that is a major strength of of the texts except for Casino Royale to date. And um, again, I, I hope that there is another graphic novel that comes out, or not graphic novel, but trade collection that comes out that is more 
like the ones that we've been talking about. I really, I actually have found this universe to be very compelling. Um, you know, when you asked me to do this, I was kind of, I mean, I was like, okay, Derek, I'll help you out, you know, <laughs> Go ahead and read these. but, but I actually became more fond of them than I would expect. And actually we had, we'd originally planned to do this show a little earlier. So it had been a while now since I'd read them. And today I was reviewing them and, um, it, it, they've created a feeling in a universe that I'm actually comfortable in, which is saying something. And I wanted to read more. And so I agree. I, I think it'll be interesting to see what, um, what way the series goes in, in the future. Mm-hmm. Wow, we looked at a lot of text, Gwen. Uh, <laughs> basically, they're nine. Uh, we looked at Varger by Warren Ellis and Jason Masters, uh, Adelon by Ellis and Masters as well, Hammerhead by Andy Diggle and Luca Casanguida, Black Box, Benjamin Percy and Ralph La- Labosco, Felix Later, James Robinson and Eric Campbell, Kill Chain by Diggle and Les Linguina, Casino Royale, Van Jensen and Dennis Calero, The Case Files by a variety of different creators, and then Body, written by Alice Cott and various artists. So, a lot. <laughs> a lot, but actually, very fast paced reading for the most part. Mm-hmm. I, I really With the found exception of be- Casino Royale. Right. And again, I think we're just setting that one aside. But but with the other <laughs> texts, it really the pacing was excellent in them. And oh, yes. the, in a couple instances, I went back and reread them afterwards, because at first I was it, they are page turners. I really was interested in what was going to happen next. They were suspenseful. Um, and again, the graphic layout in some of these volumes is exceptional. Mm-hmm. So Exactly. And if you want to find these books at incredible discounts, then... Why not go to Discount Comic Book Service, our sponsor? Please do, because there you will find, wealthy with the exception of the uh, body, every single one of the texts that we discussed today at a discount of either 30 or 35%. And more times than not, it's 35%. -hmm. So check those out. It's a great way of plunging into the world of the dynamite James Bond. That's dcbservice.com. And after you do get your Bond books there, get in touch with us and let us know what you thought about those texts. If you go to the website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up that phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. That's right. You can contact us by email at twoguys at comicsalternative.com, or you can get in touch with us individually. I'm Gwen at comicsalternative.com. Derek, how can people reach you? At Derek at comicsalternative.com. You can also find us all over social media. We have accounts on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, Slack, and Discord. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on Spotify, on TuneIn, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. I have the theme from James Bond going through my head right now. <laughs> da, 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 da. I, I would love to be able to play that in this podcast. Yeah, but, but we, com- we, we don't. Yeah. It's copyrighted music. <laughs> ah, rah, rah. Yeah, rah, rah. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I had a good time and uh, fun talking about James Bond. These are really good books. Uh, yeah. Enjoyable. So um, we will be back next week with more fun non-James Bond stuff. Until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Gwen. See you soon.
Hey, what happened?